So welcome to our third and uh, final um, presentation in the series of genomics for general practice. And tonight's a big topic, cancer genomics. Um, and this is one that I know is um, um, of great interest to um, many general practitioners. Um, this series um, is brought to you by uh, Queensland Genomics. So um, they, they're funding this um, um, endeavor. Check up um, from which David is from and uh, Sabrina working in the background there is our um, administering the lecture series and also uh, providing secretarial support and um, um, governance oversight. And tonight I'd also just like to acknowledge um, Helen Marfan, who's a, a clinical cancer geneticist from Genetic Health Queensland, who's kind of provided some of the slides I'm using in the second part of this talk. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Michael Gabbett. Um, I'm a clinical geneticist, um, primarily uh, pediatric treated, pediatrically trained, um, but have worked in the cancer space um, um, at points during my career. Um, and also have a, a long-standing interest in prenatal genetics. And at the moment, I'm um, sort of in the academic realm and I'm coordinating QUT's uh, postgraduate genomics degrees. As I've told you before, webinars are not a one-way street. Um, and I'd like to thank um, Sandra, who's already submitted some questions tonight. Thank you for that. Um, please do submit questions. I'd like to try and make this interactive. It is difficult um, when we can't really see each other. Well, I can't see you anyway. And um, it's, don't sort of get that one-on-one um, -on -one interaction and, and I guess a conversation happening, but we'll try our best if we can um, with the technologies that we have available to us. So do ask questions. I'll keep my eye on the screen here to see what questions are coming through and I'll answer them. Um, um, either real time or if it's something that I know I'm going to answer later on, I might skip over it. Um, okay. So just for a reminder um, that this is a, a good resource um, for general practitioners. It's uh, put out by the Royal, the Royal Australian College of General Practice. Um, and it's a good sort of uh, first stop for um, any questions you have regarding your patients um, on genomic issues. There is quite a bit in cancer, on cancer genetics in this uh, publication um, and gives you some pointers about where to go. Um, if, you, if you've um, got someone sitting in front of you or you have any general questions. So I re highly recommend this uh, publication. It's been written by a number of um, um, specialists in the field. And so, um, do make that a good, uh, you know, your, your first stop. Here's a, um, another resource, which I'll mention a couple of times tonight, um, EBIQ. I'm not sure what it stands for. I think evidence, uh, EBI is the, is the evidence of Q. I don't know what it stands for, but it's a, um, uh, a beast that kind of came from a, a, Queen, a New South Wales government um, institution, which kind of got a life of its own and went national and the EBIQ website is now, is, is still hosted by uh, the New South Wales government, um, hence why their logo's on it, but it's a, a national collaboration looking at um, not just ca cancer genomics, but um, cancer in general. Um, it it um, is a good resource uh, for people working with patients with cancer. Um, it has a number of uh, management guidelines as well as diagnostic guidelines but it does have a big uh, section on uh, cancer genetics there. Um, and you'll notice from this screenshot that there is um, there are referral gu guidelines available. So if you're sort of scratching your head, wondering if you should refer on um, to a genetic service, then there are um, guidelines there to help you make that decision. Um, so, um, you know, you don't feel guilty that you might be clogging up what generally are large wait lists across the country um, in public services uh, for patients um, with either a personal family history of a genetic disorder. Um, but there also has some guidelines on testing for um, 
uh, mutations, which I'll talk about just in a second. Um, um, and uh, I'll know a whole heap of other stuff. So if, if you're interested in cancer, I've got some questions in, in cancer genetics. Um, it's just worth having a look under that tab um, and seeing what resources are available. Um, all this is uh, peer reviewed by a specialist across, across the spectrum. So it's a high quality uh, website um, and I highly recommend it. Um, for those of you who have not joined us for the uh, last two um, sessions, I'll just remind, I'll just uh, inform you um, that I tell people um, um, what this word genomics means. It's one that's sort of replacing the word genetics. So the word genetics is, uh, I guess, come to uh, be more talking about single gene disorders or the study of hereditary and inherited disease. With our ability now to look at the whole genome um, in a single test, um, we can not only look at a gene of interest, but we can also look at genes um, that interact with it and modify its expression. And so uh, we, are, we are now in this era where we're not just looking at single genes when we do a test, but looking at um, a number of genes. And so the word genome, uh, you will notice is really um, replacing the word um, um, gene. And so uh, we talk about clinical genomics now rather than clinical genetics. Um, but often they're, in, often they're interchangeable, but I guess over the next five years, um, We'll, we'll be using the word genomics over genetics uh, pretty much exclusively. The other thing I tell people is that the word mutations out, we now talk about variants um, because the word mutation means different uh, things for different people. Um, the word variant is um, the preferred terminology. And then we talk about whether that variant is pathogenic. So that's causing disease or not pathogenic. Um, so that's, I guess, a, no, a normal polymorphism um, of which we have many. Although, um, having said that, I often use, still use the word mutation when talking about cancer. And I don't know if it's just a, an old habit that I just can't shake. Um, but it's, when we, I guess when we're talking about mutations in cancer genomics, uh, most people do actually speak the same language. So um, having defined the word variant in this, in this particular presentation, you will hear me use the word uh, mutation. This is just to uh, remind you um, where we're at in our life spectrum. So we started down here with um, um, uh, carrier screening in uh, couples wanting to become pregnant, pre-implantation genomic screening, um, um, uh, fetuses uh, and prenatal screening, newborn screening, went on to talk about pediatric diseases. Uh, last month, we spoke about uh, general testing in adults. And now we're sort of up this end of the spectrum looking at cancer. Well, the cancer can occur in any age group, of course, but it's um, more common in, in, in the older population. So when we talk about cancer genetics, one thing I, I do say up front is all cancer is genetic. Um, and I'm sure a number of you realize this fact, um, but I'm also surprised by a number of um, people who don't actually um, think about cancer as a genetic disease and certainly um, I've said this in, in a number of presentations and had had you know, professors of medicine come up to me and said, I don't understand what do you mean by cancer is genetic. Cancer is a disease of the genome. Um, but that's not to be confused um, with the concept that uh, cancer is hereditary. Um, hereditary cancer is uh, the minority of cancer. Cancer is the result of genetic errors that we all accumulate over the course of our life. So as we sit here um, on our planet, our DNA is constantly being bombarded um, um, with um, damaging influences. So whether that be ionizing radiation, free radicals, um, and the reason why we can um, um, survive such insults is that our cells have a number of innate mechanisms uh, there to repair that damage. And so I will talk about a class of genes tonight called the mismatch repair genes, um, which basically go in and look for um, changes in the DNA sequence, um, um, which is an acquired mutation and repairs that mutation by using the complementary stand of DNA as a template. 
not all um, insults can be repaired. And so there um, are mechanisms in, our, in every cell that if the DNA damage is too great, then that cell just gets chucked out to suicide or apoptose. Now, of course, if you've got mutations in genes that um, control how our cells react to uh, such insults, then that um, gives the cell the um, ability to circumvent these protective mechanisms. Um, and that's essentially how cancer mm -hmm. arises. When we think about what genes are involved in cancer, um, there are essentially three types. So there are those genes that I was just mentioning. So these are the, um, if you're thinking about a, um, a cell as a car, these are the, the caretakers of the, um, the cellular genome. Um, and what they're essentially caretaking is those cells that are that are regulating growth. So cancer is basically an uncontrolled growth of a, of a cell or a tissue. And so, of course, the way you can have unregulated growth is that um, your foot's on the accelerator. So um, proto-oncogenes become oncogenes when mutated and the cell accelerators um, um, pedal to the metal um, and the cell is out of control um, with growth. Or alternatively, your brakes aren't working. And so there's no negative inhibitors to cellular growth. Um, and similarly, um, the cell's out of control. And so um, most inherited cancers are actually due to problems with um, um, the brakes. Um, so these are um, 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 mutations in uh, genes which encode uh, the brakes or the tumor suppressor genes. Um, the next big class of inherited cancers are those in the uh, gatekeeping genes, so mis mismatch repair genes or, or similar. Um, mutations in oncogenes, um, I flat out thinking of an example, there are examples, I think of all oh, this one example, which is a rare cancer syndrome. Um, and they're, they're generally what we call embryonic lethal. So if they're there at the time of um, uh, conception, then basically the mistake is too great um, if it's in all the cells of the body and um, is not compatible with life. Um, so uh, they, they're not really causes of heritable genetic conditions. So as I said, as we go through life, um, our cells acquire DNA damage, and you can think of it as a bit like a staircase. As um, these mutations um, um, accumulate the cell, um, the cellular, the cell's growth becomes more and more dysregulated, and so that's why you know cancer is more of a disease of older people because they've been on the planet longer, they've been exposed to um, more uh, uh, damaging influences, um, and so it's a, uh, there is a, a, a time um, factor in developing cancer. The um, stages of um, acquiring those mutations, um, I guess, before I say that, the, at, when you acquire one mutation that, I guess, um, dysregulates cellular growth, then the cell becomes more susceptible to acquiring more uh, mutations. Um, and so it's not just a factor of um, cumulative errors, but once you've got one mutation, then the cell's more prone to um, uh, accumulating more errors. And that's because, you know, if the cell's dividing um, faster than um, what it would normally do, then obviously the cell's got a higher turnover, uh, that all, all the DNA needs to, to replicate. And so these metabolically active cells have more opportunity um, to have um, mutations, um, um, acquired into their into their DNA. And we see, can see that um, not just at the DNA level, but we also see it um, at the histopathological level. So um, as you know, if we think of something like um, uh, um, a bowel cancer, colorectal cancer, we start off with a nice healthy epithelium. Um, as we go through life, um, we will acquire mutations in our 
colorectal epithelium, some cellular um, growth dysregulation occurs and that um, he he healthy um, epithelium will develop a, a bit of a metaplasia at first, then you might develop an adenoma or a polyp. Um, so this isn't cancer, but it's the, the forerunner of cancer. And um, bowel cancers basically arise in polyps. Um, so the cellular growth dysregulation that's occurring those early uh, lesions aren't cancerous per se, but as more um, errors accumulate, then the cell um, acquires uh, more and more immortality. It um, de-differentiates. It breaks through cellular normal cellular boundaries and tissue planes. That's the definition of, of cancer. So when we think about individuals with a heritable gene, gene change, why they're at um, higher risk of um, developing cancer is just like the rest of us, they're on that staircase to what you could consider an inev inevitable um, consequence of life, and that is developing cancer. And it is said that if you don't die from anything else, then the chances are you're going to die from cancer. Um, they um, don't need as many steps to develop the cancer. And so what we see um, as clues, I guess, to heritable to cancer is that um, because there is less time to accumulate errors because they're already starting off with one error, uh, cancers tend to develop, develop at a younger age. And these, um, that, that very initial error that uh, such individuals have is present in all their cells. It's something they've inherited from their, their parent. Um, and so they're prone to, to multiple cancers. So when we think about most cancers, they um, are what we call somatically acquired mutations. So when I say all cancer is genetic, if you get a piece of tissue, you sequence that tissue, you will find um, genetic errors in that cancer tissue. Um, germline mutations, as I said before, these are mutations which are present in the um, egg or sperm cell that's gone to make a person. So they're um, inherited um, mutations, or sometimes they occur what we say de novo. So these are new mutations which occur, um, they can, well, I guess they can arise de novo in the sperm or egg cell or in the very um, early stages of embryonic development. We're talking about the one or two cell stage with the zygote. Um, and they, uh, they propagate throughout all cells of an individual um, including that individual's germ cells, so their own um, ovaries or testes, so they can pass that on to their offspring. Um, and these is what, this is um, what we call a germline mutation. Um, and that's what gives rise to inherited cancers. And these are rare, less than 5% of cancers that um, are diagnosed. Most cancers um, uh, acquired mutations, so that's somatic mutations. Cancer, um, as I inferred before, is uh, common um, because it's an inevitable consequence of uh, being on the planet. Um, one in two people will be diagnosed with cancer. Um, and there are big ticket items um, when looking at cancer um, epidemiology, uh, colorectal cancer um, is a common cancer and we all have a at least a 5% uh, or 1 in 20 lifetime risk of developing colorectal cancer. Um, breast cancer is common. So um, the, the figures always seem to fluctuate when I look at them, um, but a 1 in 8 or 13% chance um, uh, for women developing breast cancer. And prostate cancer is a bit of a, a difficult one um, because um, I don't know if you've heard the, the axiom that all men die with but not from prostate cancer. And that's why there's controversies in prostatic cancer screening um, because of that concern that we're finding um, tumors that aren't gonna go on and kill somebody. Um, but if we look at prostate cancer and by that, um, I mean, um, 
true aggressive cancer, it's a similar risk to, to breast cancer. So these are, these are common cancers. Um, and for those three um, tumors, well, the search, certainly for colorectal cancer and breast cancer, there's population screening um, for people at population risk because the population uh, risk is a, is a high number. Um, and of course there is screening for prostate cancer, um, but whether or not we should participate in that seems to be an eternal um, um, argument in, in the medical literature. So if you have somebody come into your um, practice who's worried about developing cancer because they have a family history of cancer, well, having a family history of cancer is, is normal. If one in two people um, develop cancer, I would um, argue it's pretty abnormal not to have a family history of cancer. So the trick is trying to work out when we need to be concerned about the uh, uh, potential family risk. When is the family history of cancer not uh, a normal family history? And there's some of the clues that I'll um, look at now. So some of the general features of um, an inherited uh, cancer predisposition syndrome, and these are things that I just mentioned before, a cancer diagnosed at a young age. Now, what does young mean? Um, well, it's uh, how long is this piece of string? But if you look at two of the, the biggest, um, um, almost common rather, heritable cancers, um, so it's familial breast ovarian cancer and familial colorectal cancer, uh, we start worrying about those in breast cancer when um, a person's been diagnosed at less than 40 years of age, of colorectal cancer if somebody's been diagnosed in, um, in um, under uh, 50 years of age. Now there's nothing magical with those numbers, they're sort of just, just guidelines. Um, so if you had a family uh, history of say colorectal cancer and everybody's in their early 50s, um, obviously you've got multiple diagnoses, but um, they're all sort of, you know, relatively young in, in, the, in, in the young 50s. So even though the guidelines will say less than 50, that's not an absolute cutoff. Um, another feature is that we're looking at um, a single type of cancer, but it's multifocal. So there's more than one primary. Um, in particular, uh, bowel cancer's a, a good example if you've got more than one primary bowel cancer. Um, or for paired organs, if there's bilateral uh, cancers. So bilateral uh, breast cancers um, is um, a, an alarm bell that we might be dealing with um, a heritable uh, predisposition. Also, if we're dealing with multiple cancers and not just in the individual, but in a family um, of different types. And um, what we try to do in that situation is look at those cancers in the one individual family and try to work out if they belong to what we call a cancer syndrome. So heritable get breast cancer um, um, is paired with uh, most commonly um, ovarian cancer. So that's what's called heritable breast ovarian cancer. But other cancers um, which are caused by mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations or caused by um, mutations in either of those two genes are things like uh, prostate cancer or pancreatic cancer. Um, so they're, they're part of those cancer syndromes. And this is, uh, if you prefer a patient to a genetic service, they'll be looking at these types of patterns. Um, colorectal cancer um, is not just a um, disease of, of the color, colorectum of the large bowel. Um, people with um, heritable colorectal cancer are also high risk of gastric cancer. So it's a um, gastrointestinal uh, cancer predisposition, if you like. Um, in Lynch syndrome, um, sebaceous adenoma, uh, which isn't a cancer, but I suppose it can turn into an adenocarcinoma, um, is a um, you know, reasonably rare type of skin lesion, um, but one which has a high um, occurrence in, in Lynch syndrome. So these are uh, clues um, when we examine a family history of cancer. If um, we've got all these disparate cancers, they may actually come together under the one umbrella to suggest a specific cancer syndrome. And the next thing we look for are unusual cancers. So not all breast cancer arises in females, about um, one in a hundred breast cancers can occur in males, um, but a male breast cancer 
um, is rare. And so that's uh, an alarm bell that it, you know, we're dealing with a person or a family with a heritable predisposition. And then there are cancers which are you know, really quite unusual, like adrenal cortical carcinoma is not one that you come across every day. And certainly that's something that's um, uh, unusual, but also associated with um, heritable syndrome, which I'll talk about later. So if you've got someone in your um, um, room and they are worried about cancer, uh, heritable cancer, usually because they've got a family history or they themselves may have had cancer, you're worried about what to do. If you look up the guidelines and uh, try to work it out, most of them will have this, um, well, I won't say unhelpful, but it's <laughs> sort of just refer to a clinical genetic service uh, line in it. Um, and certainly, um, you know, I guess autonomous um, doctors may want to take the reins in their own hands and just referring on to the clinical genetic service may not be um, um, as satisfying as, as doing something yourself. There are a lot of um, caveats um, when it comes to, um, well, I guess there's a lot of time, first of all, so that um, information that I went through trying to work all that out um, does take time and may be out of the purview of a general practitioner to, to take a comprehensive family history and confirm all the diagnoses in a family. So a clinical genetic service um, it exists, so um, you know, they, they actually do that. Um, um, but there are caveats in genetic testing, which I'll come to uh, in a moment. So if you do refer to a clinical genetic service, what will they do? Um, well, they will assess the likelihood that a genetic predisposition is present. And there's two reasons why they do that. The first um, is to work out, well, what's the risks of the individuals to the risks of the, um, if the individual sitting in front of them? Um, is that, do they need to be worried um, about cancer? Do we, they need some sort of intervention um, to monitor for cancer? And the second big question um, that is asked is, can genetic testing help us in this situation? Now, because genetic services um, have limited budgets, they can't offer genetic testing to everyone who walks through the door. So um, they have to have some sort of triaging process to, uh, in order to offer people testing. So just because you refer someone to a genetic service, that's by no means guaranteed that they're, they're gonna be offered a test. Um, when a patient attends a clinical genetic service, um, what the um, counsellors um, or clinical geneticists do is first of all, um, confirm the diagnoses in the family. And it's not just of the, the person sitting in front of them if they happen to be affected with cancer, um, but multiple other people in, in the, all other, pe other people in the family. And that's a, that's a big task because you can't just go and access someone else's medical records. Um, there needs to be a coordinated effort to get permission to access people's, uh, to access people's medical records, um, look at their histopathology, because what's reported um, in the family often um, turns out not to be the case. So for instance, people say, yeah, my, my mother had um, um, cancer of the uterus um, and endometrial cancer, of course, is associated with uh, Lynch syndrome, the heritable bowel condition. Um, but when you go and look at the histopathology, you find out it's cervical cancer, which of course is a, an environmental um, disease. Um, cancers of the, the liver or the, the bone or bone or brain um, um, often turn out not to be cancers of liver, bone or brain simply because they're common sites of metastases. Um, and you might find that these, um, um, if you look, go and look at the histopathology, offer um, very valuable cl clues as to if, um, you know, a potential cancer predisposition syndrome because we might be dealing with metastatic uh, um, um, bowel cancer or breast cancer. The other thing they do is not just look at um, what types of cancer they are, but certainly there are histopathological features which might um, give a clues as to what sort of um, genetic cancer predisposition, predisposition syndrome is being dealt with. So um, you might have heard of triple negative breast cancer. So uh, these are triple negative for hormone receptors, estrogen, progesterone, and HER2. Um, and that's um, a sign of a very aggressive breast cancer, um, which correlates with mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2. 
BRCA2. Um, if a um, person has had bowel polyps, something like a hyperplastic polyp, um, is rather common and one or two hyperplastic polyps um, is, is quite normal. Um, um, whereas um, a tubulovillus adenoma, another type of, of polyp, um, is um, more correlated with um, heritable bowel cancer and uh, TVAs, if, if they're you know, in their hundreds of thousands, um, um, are pretty much diagnostic of familial adenomatous polyposis. So these are the clues that um, um, genetic counsels are looking for. Now, once all that information has been gathered, the next thing is to think about, well, is genetic testing gonna help us? Um, and if the decision is yes, then as I said, they need to be able to triage. And the, the cutoff point is generally, if there's a high percent chance of finding uh, a mutation. Um, and again, high is a, a rather, um, um, subjective word, um, but generally the um, number that is the cutoff is a 10% chance. So if there's a 10% chance or greater of finding a mutation, then um, genetic testing is generally offered. The other thing is um, you're not really wanting to, um, if possible, uh, test in the first instance an unaffected individual in the family. Um, simply because if you don't find a mutation, you don't know if you're not finding a mutation because there's not one to be found, or that is that it's not a um, familial um, type of cancer, um, or if or um, potentially there is a mutation in the family, um, but whatever platform you use to look for that mutation just hasn't found it. So the highest chance of you've got of finding a mutation is an affected individual, and so genetic. Um, clinical genetic services work with families to try and get an affected individual in for testing and should a mutation be found in that particular person then uh, cascade testing can occur throughout the family. When um, testing is arranged in a clinical genetic service that is uh, covered by um, the hospital budget um, um, but there are um, in private land um, in, in recent years, um, there have been a number of additions to um, the, medical, uh, the medical benefit schedule and there are rebates available for um, certain cancer testing, um, in particular for breast and bowel again. Um, but these aren't tests, uh, so the, the, I guess theoretically anyone can order the tests, um, but the rebate's not available um, if a general practitioner organises the test. Um, or a surgeon, or maybe the surgeon can, but certainly um, um, uh, consultant physicians, are, um, and that includes clinical geneticists, can access, or the patient can access um, the MBS rebate um, if a um, physician orders the test. The clinical genetic service um, doesn't just offer, doesn't just do that sort of detective work and organise testing or counsel the testing if, counsel the patient if testing is not available to them through publicly, um, but they also look after the, the patient themselves. And so that's where genetic counsel, counsels are in, 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 um, invaluable uh, because they offer that uh, pre and post test counselling. Um, if they, um, if a patient doesn't qualify um, for genetic testing, they uh, need to explain why that's the case. Um, but the other thing is, um, you know, families and individuals um, do get quite um, um, hung up on the idea of, of genetic testing um, um, because it is quite um, prevalent in the media. Um, and so, you know, patients need to be counseled that, you know, genetic testing is not the be all and end all, um, that even if a mutation is not found, then um, they still might be at high risk of developing cancer and still need to undertake a particular monitoring. Um, but also, if someone doesn't qualify, then in the public sector, then you'll generally find that a clinical genetic service is um, uh, happy to facilitate private testing. Um, and it would be rare that they would say, no, absolutely, you can't have testing at all. 
uh, they may recommend against it. Um, but if a patient or a family is quite insistent on it, um, I would hope that they would facilitate private testing and then the patient would be out of pocket uh, for the results. But the advantage of that, of course, is that that testing is occurring in the confines of a um, genetic counselling consultation. And so if a negative test result does come um, back from that process, then they will receive counselling and um, you know, their residual risk, cancer risk, um, will be communicated to them and recommendations made accordingly. So does the clinical genetic service need to be involved when ordering a test? Well, absolutely not. Um, although for reasons I've just said, I would argue it's preferable that they are. Um, but as we discussed last month, um, direct consumer testing is completely possible. So um, that's to say that no doctor at all needs to be involved. And um, I um, don't recommend any of these companies necessarily. They're just ones that I um, found through a quick Google search. Um, um, but there are multiple um, companies out there that um, offer direct-to-consumer testing. And so, as we ha have already discussed, um, a patient can come into your practice waving the genetic test result in their hand saying, what does this mean? Or, oh my God, I'm worried, I've got a high risk of cancer. And so that really does put you in a bit of a position um, because um, genetic test results aren't necessarily um, quick to digest. Um, there might be um, a number of different pieces of information that uh, need to be synthesized into a, a conclusion. Um, and it might be something that um, a doctor needs help with in interpreting um, and that can come down to the quality of the, the report um, and these three companies I happen to put up here um, as I said I don't necessarily recommend them but I, the ones that I would think to be of, of you know, reasonable quality um, but you know, so if I saw these logos on the on the on the letterhead or on the report then um, you know, I'd be comfortable that the report should be reading well and that the information in it is, is uh, trustworthy. Um, but if you're not familiar with companies, then again, how do you know um, if this direct-to-consumer test is, is trustworthy? Um, Myriad um, is a, um, you know, a long-standing genetic uh, testing company, which, are, which has a very a good international reputation. So if I saw, you know, the test had been done by Myriad, then yeah, I'd be very happy with that. Um, this Eugene, um, I just I saw that and thought, oh, that's an awful name. It kind of it sounds like eugenics, um, which um, is something that <laughs> is not exactly um, uh, politically correct. Um, and I was going to dismiss that, and I looked into it. Um, I read a bit about the platform they used. Um, and then I saw that their medical director um, is a very respected colleague of mine. I thought, well, there you go. So um, even though their name um, might be a little unpalatable, um, now um, having done my research on Eugene, um, I've come to the conclusion that they would offer a quality service. Um, but you know, I guess um, I know what good platforms are. I know who are reputable geneticists to be involved. Um, so it was easy for me to come back to that conclusion. It might not be so easy um, if, even if that information is freely available on the internet um, um, for you to be able to interpret it. How do you pick a good direct-to-consumer test? Um, well, as I say, you get what you pay for. Um, I can pretty much guarantee that, um, you know, if it's a cheap test, um, it's too good to be true. Um, um, a cheap test is always going to be, say always. I try not to always. I try to never say always, but um, um, you know, a, a cheap test is you know will be bad. Let's face it. And what do I mean by cheap? Less than five hundred dollars. And again, that's not a hard and fast number, but certainly if we're looking at a test for um, cancer genetic testing. Um, and it's under five hundred dollars, and the chances are it's, it's not going to be a, a good test. Um, but having said that, 
if you're looking at a pretty expensive test, um, and again, it's a, that's a relative term expensive, but something out of over $1,500 for a, a direct to consumer panel test, I'd be thinking, are they trying to rip me off here? You know, there could be better deals available. Um, now that's not to say that an expensive test is a bad test. It could be it's, a, it's an extra, extraordinarily good test. And one of the reasons it's expensive is because there are uh, multiple, uh, they use a very high uh, quality platform. Um, it's got good coverage. Um, there's um, top bioinformatics analysis. Um, and so, you know, it is worth the, the, the charge that they're um, asking for. Um, um, but there could be better deals out there. And again, that's information which um, it might be hard to judge just uh, based on what's on the internet site. Um, we'll, I look at the technology um, that the uh, test is um, undertaken upon. So most of these tests are now going to be a next generation sequencing technology. And so you'll see terms like, um, usually it's whole exome or WES sequencing whole exome sequencing, um, rarely whole genome sequencing. If it's whole genome sequencing, it is going to be a um, good test um, with a good coverage. And I've said greater than one, uh, greater than 30, sorry, I had my research hat on when I was thinking that. You want, you want higher than that. Um, you'll, you want um, sort of in the vicinity of 120 or, or greater. Um, and that's uh, what we refer to as the depth of coverage, how many times um, each, um, I guess, um, nucleotides is, is sequenced um, in, in the test because um, each time a nucleotide is sequenced, there's errors can be um, um, it, it can be an erroneous results with next generation sequencing, and so these tests need to uh, sequence multiple times. And generally, we consider um, you know greater than one hundred and twenty certainly is what we call a good depth of coverage. But um, what you're looking for most definitely is, um, well, what you'd be discarding most definitely is if it's a single nucleotide polymorphism based test, a SNP based test. And these are the tests that are gonna cost sort of tens to hundreds of dollars, um, that less than $500 test. There's no role of SNP tape testing in, in cancer genetic testing basically. Um, so um, I guess if, you were, if you've got a, a patient who comes to you with a SNP based test that um, um, uh, reports they've got an increased risk of cancer? I'd definitely be taking that with more than one grain of salt. Um, the other thing, as I inferred before, is uh, um, most um, direct to consumer tests on, online will tell you um, about a bit, a little bit about who, who they are. And you want to be see the involvement of. Um, um, you know, genetic health professionals. Um, and as I said last time, not just somebody who's done a PhD in genetics, you can sort of, you know, do your PhD in fruit fly genetics and have a PhD in genetics, but you're looking for someone who's um, qualified in um, diagnostic genetics, so a, gen a genetic pathologist, a clinical geneticist, and a genetic counselor. And a really good direct to consumer test. Um, We'll have a genetic counsellor that helps with helps the patient through the process and counsel them through the process, and that of course adds to the cost. So, if we find a mutation, now what? Um, well, the um, a, a genetic service uh, will be able to help with um, um, designing a um, surveillance program for the patient. Um, they themselves don't actually run it, um, but they help put it together. Um, and for some individuals, prophylactic surgery uh, might be the, might be a good option. Um, so, uh, I guess if you're at high risk of colorectal cancer, then you're hardly going to um, have your colon removed prophylactically. Um, but a woman um, may want to consider having um, um, her uterus removed because endometrial cancer is associated with uh, something like Lynch syndrome um, after childbearing is complete, of course breast ovarian cancer, um, um, prophylactic mastectomies um, certainly isn't um, something that um, a lot of women um, take up. Um, and certainly with um, the advent of um, breast MRI um, in, for surveillance, and there's that's now also on the MBS, uh, um, making it um, more affordable for, for, for women. Um, then they um, often choose just to have 
um, breast surveillance rather than prophylactic surgery. Um, but um, ovarian cancer, um, by its very nature, is often diagnosed late, and so it's got a high mortality rate once diagnosed. And so um, prophylactic oophorectomy um, is a, a rather common um, prophylactic surgery for women with heritable breast ovarian cancer to have. Um, and again, after childbearing is complete or certainly after, after the menopause or before the menopause, um, then um, you, you'd want to um, consider um, some sort of hormone replacement therapy. And these are best um, undertaken, both surveillance and obviously the surgery, undertaken by a specialist, a specialist in that organ system. And so if we're dealing with a cancer syndrome, then we could be dealing with multiple specialists. So, um, you know, a breast surgeon and a gynecologist um, um, for her, um, hereditary breast ovarian, a um, um, colorectal surgeon or a gastroenterologist and a, and a gynecologist um, uh, for Lynch syndrome, endocrinologist for a number of the uh, um, heritable um, endocrine conditions, which are rare and I won't speak about tonight. Um, sometimes a dermatologist, a urologist, if it's we're thinking about something like a prostate um, predisposition in a male, um, but certainly a clinical geneticist in their advice back to a referring general practitioner um, will um, um, list what specialists need to be involved and um, provide guidelines for the management of these heritable cancer syndromes. Um, so um, because these tend to be uh, multi-organ. GPs do play a very important role in the coordination of care. Once we've found a mutation, uh, cascade testing or predictive testing of other family members is possible. And this is, uh, you know, obviously I have a very biased opinion on this, but this is always best done by a, a genetic counselor or clinical geneticist. So this should be done in a um, um, genetic service by, um, and many labs in this part of the world actually would reject a sample uh, for predictive testing um, if it hasn't come from um, a um, service where they know that the, a patient has received genetic counselling. And that is because there are risks involved in predictive testing. Um, there are um, big emotional risks. Now those emotional risks um, are difficult to predict and genetic counsellors uh, are very skilled at, um, I guess, finding out how much is riding emotionally um, on um, uh, or for a person on having a, a test result. And these um, emotional, um, the degree of emotional um, or potential reactions is often um, subject to, you know, what's happened in the family, what an individual's uh, life experiences with cancer either themselves or you know a close family member um, so if somebody finds out they have a high risk of cancer that, that um, you know there is a, a high risk that they might have an adverse emotional reaction um, but what we also see is um, people um, who have predictive testing who you know start off with an a priori risk of a one in two chance of having a familial mutation um, whose um, parent had it, who all their siblings have, they have predictive testing and find out that they don't have it, um, then they can have a, what's essentially a survivor guilt. Um, you know, they can be racked with a, a, a emotional baggage uh, because of the, the one person in the family who doesn't have the mutation. Now, there are also potential financial implications with predictive testing. Um, having said that, at the moment, they're not as big as they were um, um, gee, what, 12 months ago, maybe 18 months ago now, um, because the Financial Services Council has put a moratorium on using genetic test results um, to either decline insurance or low to premiums. Um, and that moratorium is in place until 2024 when it will be reviewed, or hopefully it will be reviewed before then so we know what's going to happen. Um, but what they do put is um, limits on the amount for which you can be in insured. And so Patients need to be, need to know what those financial limits are before they have predictive testing. If they think they're going to have, um, they, they're going to want to acquire some sort of um, insurance that protects their income. So, in 
protect insurance um, or life insurance um, or TPD. Um, and again, these is something that genetic, uh, clinical geneticists and genetic counselors are very cognizant of um, and they do it for a living. And so um, they can talk to patients, um, talk them through that process. And when predictive testing occurs, then um, people uh, do actually sign a formal consent form to have uh, testing. And so the labs, if they see, a, if they receive a sample from a clinical genetic service, even if they've not seen the um, actual signed consent, um, they uh, can be very confident that um, signed consent has been um, obtained and the patient's been informed of these uh, risks. Now, if a uh, direct-to-consumer test though, um, I guess this warning you know, doesn't necessarily need to be a direct-to-consumer test, but in the clinical genetic service, um, again, they're very cognizant of this uh, point, um, but if you were to come across a, a result of a genetic test, a negative test or a normal test does not mean that no predisposition is present. Um, and the reasons that's the case is that you know, a patient might be concerned about their family history of cancer. They go to get online, they order the test, uh, come back with this uh, normal or negative test. Woohoo, um, I'm off the hook. Um, it, that might not be, might, be, not, might not be the case. So these tests, as I said, um, tend to be next generation sequencing tests. Um, and there are certain mutations um, which they um, aren't good at detecting. Um, so large gene rearrangements such as exon deletions or duplications, um, certain NGS platforms um, just don't detect. And so there could be a mutation in the family. Um, and so a negative test result still needs to be interpreted in the context of family history. Um, it could be that they um, picked up the wrong gene panel. So they're worried about their family history of breast cancer. They had the breast cancer panel test, um, um, but they, for whatever reason, have um, ignored a number of other um, cancers in the family, which aren't breast or ovarian cancer. And so that gene panel doesn't actually test for the gene of interest, um, which is causing cancer in that particular family. So th there is a degree of interpretation that needs to occur even, in this, even when a negative test result um, is, is given. The other thing is that the wrong person in the family is tested. Um, and so, um, as I said before, you want to test a person who's actually, preferably, who is affected or has been affected with cancer, because if a, a heritable mutation is present, then obviously it's done its job in the person who's had cancer. You know they've got the mutation, or they, you know they should have the mutation. And so you want to be looking for mutations in that particular individual. Looking for a mutation in a person who hasn't had cancer, it could be, um, you don't know if it comes out negative, if there's no mutation to be found in that family, um, um, or there is a mutation to be found in the family. Um, it's just that that particular individual um, hasn't had their cancer yet, um, and the technology can't find it. So. Um, to get the most information, you want to be testing somebody who's actually had the mutation. Um, but you know there are um, exceptions to that, um, even in the public system. Um, they not they very rarely, but they do sometimes test people who haven't been affected with cancer when they're looking for a mutation in a family. Um, when a when no mutation has been found, um, the the counselling that is involved. Um, will depend on why the test was done. So if it's just what we call the worried well, um, which is quite common um, and, and genetic services will often reject referrals if it's apparently um, a person who seems to be um, worried well. So that's to say they don't have a significant family history. They've got a sort of a population um, risk um, family history. Um, if a negative test comes back in that, uh, setting, if it's um, then um, it's, the chances are that that person is going to resort back to their population risk. But if a person uh, chooses to undergo direct to consumer testing, um, it comes back normal and they still have this, you know, massive family history of um, breast cancer or ovarian cancer, then um, 
I would be very cautious to say that, but they're back to population risk. You'd want to use guidelines to uh, look at their family history, and um, there are a number of the guidelines to tell you if they're um, population risk, moderately increased risk, or, or high risk. And we'll look at a couple of those resources if we have time a bit later. Okay, so I'll just look at um, two lots of cancer uh, in, in more detail, um, and I will continue to concentrate on breast cancer and colorectal cancer simply because um, they are common. They're the ones that um, people are most likely to um, attend um, with a family history or personal history. Um, they're the ones that people get worried about. Um, they're certainly the ones that are reported most in the media. Um, but there are uh, literally dozens of, of heritable cancer syndromes, but we obviously don't have time to go through all those. Um, um, but, you know, should you come across an individual who has um, a personal or family history of other types of cancer, um, then I would suggest you uh, seek advice as to whether the cancers you're dealing with um, are part of a, of a syndrome or not. Okay. So um, although we say familial breast cancer um, is common, if you took a thousand um, women, 920 of them um, will never develop breast cancer. Um, so the odds are um, that a woman won't develop breast cancer, then she would develop breast cancer. Um, and when, when you think of it in the, like that in those, in those terms, um, it really does sort of contextualize that um, whilst the risk is high, um, it's, it's not something that's um, inevitable um, for a female. And I, th I think a lot of women do get understandably anxious about their breast cancer risk um, because we um, want to, uh, I guess, encourage women to have screening uh, because, you know, death from breast cancer is highly preventable, especially if it's um, diagnosed early. Um, but it's, if, you, if you kind of take a step back, then, you know, the odds are that a woman will not develop breast cancer. Of those thousand women, 80 will develop breast cancer. Um, um, but of those 80, only four will have a very strong familial predisposition to breast cancer. So heritable predispositions to this breast cancer um, are not common um, when you sort of take a step back and uh, look at the entire forest. There are a number of reasons why we might see a familial cluster of breast cancer. Um, now, because it's, it is common and we'll just round it up to um, we'll say 10% that uh, figure I just showed you. There was um, using the 8% figure, since others use 13% figure, it kind of varies. Um, but the, it's, it's around 10% lifetime risk of a woman developing uh, breast cancer. Um, and because it's common, then it could be just pure chance that you'll have one or more women in a family with breast cancer. Um, these um, cancers uh, aren't just well, I guess whilst I say cancer is a genetic condition, um, they're not due to purely heritable genetic factors. Uh, we share not only our genes with our close family, but we also share our environment. And so if there are environmental um, risk factors uh, for developing um, cancer, then we're gonna be sharing those with our family members as well. So it could be shared environmental factors, or it could be a combination of both. Um, it could be um, um, environmental factors and a number of not strong heritable, uh, well, what we thought of as Mendelian gen genes, but a number of different polymorphisms or variants that come together um, in the one person or the one family, um, which increases the risk to say moderate increased risk of breast cancer, but it's not something that we uh, you know, test for like a BRCA mutation. Um, there are gene, um, genes which, well, I guess all genes are passed down through, the, through a, a family um, with a 50% chance, but there are genes which confer what we call a, a, a moderate risk 
to, to breast cancer. I'll get, talk about this in a, in a bit more soon, but um, BRCA1 and 2 um, are what we call high risk, um, or mutations in those genes are high risk alleles. Um, but there are genes which just confer a moderate uh, risk of breast cancer. Um, and they're a bit trickier to deal with. Um, if you've got a high risk of developing breast cancer, then there are you know, very um, you know, well-proven interventions that we can um, put in place to decrease the risk of dying from breast cancer. When you're looking at moderate risk alleles, um, it gets a bit trickier and you sort of have to do that risk benefit analysis. Um, so the, you know, the benefit of um, say something like prophylactic surgery is you know, not going to be um, as, you know, as, as high as it if it's a high risk allele. Um, but as, we, as I said, there could be high risk alleles in the family um, and they're, they're a bit more clear cut. Um, I don't expect you to learn all these genes, and I try to keep away from this a bit in my talks because uh, I don't want to overburden you with um, information you're not going to remember. Um, but the one gene that, or the two genes rather, that uh, people will um, be worried about are BRCA1 and BRCA2, or BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, and that's those high risk genes um, predisposed to breast cancer, um, but also ovarian cancer. Uh, prostate cancer in males, in particular BRCA2, um, and also pancreatic cancer, in particular BRCA2. So prostate and, and cancer, pancreatic cancers are other clues that you might be dealing with a heritable breast cancer syndrome. Um, I highlight there CHECK2. This is one of those moderate breast cancer risks, and CHECK2 um, will appear on a number of direct-to-consumer tests um, because it's easy to add into a next-generation sequencing panel. And if a pathogenic variant in CHECK2 is found, that's one of those ones where, you know, you're not, that doesn't put a woman at high risk of breast cancer. It sort of puts, does increase the risk to a moderate risk, but not a high risk. So you wouldn't be referring them off to prophylactic, for prophylactic breast surgery um, if you found a CHECK2 mutation. Um, but, you know, there might be women that still insist that they have um, such surgery, um, such as their anxiety for developing breast cancer. Um, but of course, those women need um, you know, intensive uh, counselling, both from you know, genetic counsellors and from uh, our breast surgeons. So it's not all uh, clear cut. Um, I think I've probably spoken about that enough, so I'll keep going. When assessing a woman with breast cancer, these are uh, the red flags that we look out for. Um, and I guess these are uh, specific red flags, but they are just uh, um, examples of those, um, um, of, of what I said earlier in the, of the, uh, in the talk that apply to all cancers. These just apply specifically to breast cancer. So a young age of, of diagnosis, um, the histopathology, the type of breast cancer. So I think I've already mentioned tonight that a triple negative hormone receptor uh, cancer is it aggressive. And that's um, a signal you could be dealing with a heritable uh, breast cancer. Male breast cancer is uncommon. Uh, so that's one of those rare um, cancers. So if you see that in a patient or their family, then that's a, an alarm bell. Bilateral disease, uh, we've mentioned. Um, the, the family history. Um, the other thing with breast cancer is Jewish ancestry. Um, there are a number of what we call founder mutations um, in um, Jewish population, which predisposed to, to, to breast cancer. And so Jewish ancestry is actually a risk factor for um, having a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Now, there are a number of tools that um, can be used, and these are things um, which you, you can use in, in, a, in a GP service if you wanted to, uh, but chances are you'd be uh, referring on to have this done. But just for your information, and edification. Um, this is what frequently occurs in a um, cancer genetic clinic is that they do use validated tools to try and work out um, what's the chance of there being a heritable dis uh, um, predisposition. And there are a number of tools. Um, this is one that um, is used at Genetic Health Queensland. It's called the Manchester uh, Scoring System. Um, and a Manchester score um, is basically a checklist. You go down those um, different features of the breast cancer uh, 
um, and these are features within the family. Um, uh, so is there free, uh, female breast cancer under 30? You see that scores very highly at 11. Um, look for male breast cancer again. That scores very highly, whether it's under um, whether it's under or over 60, uh, 10 or 13. Uh, prostate cancer that's common, so it doesn't score as highly as highly. Um, then uh, the type of cancer, so lobular cancers, for instance, are not strongly associated with uh, BRC one or two mutations. So that actually goes against the chance of finding a mutation. All those features are, are tallied up. Um, and then a, a chance, the chance of finding mutation can be um, extrapolated from the score. So um, it's been a while since I've done this, but I think a score of 15 um, gives about a 10% chance of um, finding a mutation. And so that person would qualify for testing in the public system. Um, and so um, that's what cancer services do. So now you know um, when your patient's sent back and so they don't qualify for testing, um, that's why. Oh, there we go. And so, um, yes, yeah, so I said 10% is the, the magical cutoff score. Now, there are um, um, other conditions um, which do have breast cancer as a feature. Um, and that's another reason why you might want to uh, refer to a genetic service, in particular if you're dealing with um, unusual cancers in a family that you think, well, we've got this hot, strong family history of breast cancer, um, but look at these other cancers. I can't fit it in. It's, it's not a syndrome I recognize. Let's ask a geneticist. Um, again, there are, there, sorry, there are a number of, of, of conditions, but I'll talk about leaf round any syndrome simply because it's a serious condition. Um, um, and there are a number of um, um, types of tumors that are, I guess, um, almost pathognomonic of leaf round any syndrome. Um, so a sarcoma, um, adrenal cortical carcinoma, um, um, brain tumors, leukemias, um, and adrenal cortical, I said adrenal cortical carcinoma already. So these, if there are multiple, if, it, if, the, um, if a number of these cancers are arising in the family, then you have to be worried about this leaf or any syndrome. These are um, um, clinical diagnostic guidelines um, and there are a number of, as you can see, a number of different guidelines uh, to diagnose this, this condition. Um, but I mean, truth be told in this day and age, if you had even two of these tumors in a family, you'd probably be doing genetic testing for TP53. Um, it's not a very nice condition, really. You don't want to be diagnosing it. Here's a, a family history, um, which hopefully if, it, if you, managed to obtain this family history in uh, your practice, you'd be thinking, oh my God, what am I dealing with here? So first of all, we've got multiple cancers. Secondly, um, you can see we're dealing with something that looks dominant. It goes down through four generations. Um, more people in this family than not are affected with cancer. Um, so that's, that's pretty alarming. Um, there's a, a number of, of breast cancer cases in the family. Um, including the person, this little arrow here signifies that that's your proband, that's the person who's sitting uh, on the other side of your desk, uh, but they've also had a sarcoma. So there you go, they've got had two tumors, uh, two different types of tumors. Um, there's um, also other sarcomas in the family. I thought there was, yes, their daughter had a sarcoma. Uh, their daughter had adrenal cortical carcinoma, an unusual tumor, brain tumors, CNS. Um, LMS must be myosarcoma, osteosarcoma. So um, these are, are fitting a, a pattern, but it goes beyond just a breast cancer a pattern. There's, there are other tumors there. Um, and um, this is this just screams leaf from any syndrome. Um, very young onset breast cancer. Um, um, is a, a sign that you might be dealing with uh, leaf or many. Um, and it's been estimated that um, up to, well, around 5% of people, women with breast cancer under the age of 30, um, even if they have no family history of breast cancer, could have a mutation that's TP53. Um, and the reason why they don't have a family history um, is because this uh, gene, I guess, can be predisposed to new mutations or de novo mutations. 
Um, so I wouldn't let a lack of family history necessarily put you off from um, referring to a, a genetic service. So, a, you know, 25 year old with breast cancer, that's, that's unusual, isn't it? Um, even if they don't have a family history, then um, a, breast, a um, referral to genetic service would be recommended. Um, the, um, because you know, the, the cancers involved in this are multiple and they're quite aggressive, um, the, with the exception of breast cancer surveillance um, um, regimens haven't been proven to um, decrease the chance of um, cancer associated death. So it's not a nice condition to um, have to diagnose. What we often find is, um, well, I'll say worried well, but that's really downplaying, it, down, downplaying any emotional um, um, suffering that a person might have because of their family history of, of breast cancer. But it's a very common re reason for referral to genetic services, because there are a lot of, um, we're dealing with breast cancer, we'll say um, women, um, but with other cancers, men as well, um, who've got a family history, they themselves haven't been affected with cancer um, and the geneticists are asked to see them um, to have a look, could this be familial? Um, these take up a lot of um, referrals within the system. Um, and it's one of the reasons why it takes so long to see geneticists in the public system um, because there are a lot of these in the wait list. Um, um, should you be able to upskill yourself, um, and we have talked about some um, resources available to you, um, these women don't necessarily need to be referred into a genetic service. Now, of course, if you don't feel comfortable counselling such women um, and you're worried that you might be missing something, I'm not discouraging you to refer uh, from referring, um, but if you do familiar, familiarise yourself with um, just a couple of these resources, it's quite easy to get your head around what's a, a population risk family history, what's a moderate risk family history, what's a high risk family history, um, and then counsel what based on that. And so if you've got an unaffected woman who's at average or slightly above average risk of breast cancer or population risk of breast cancer, then the genetic service is, is unlikely to do anything with them. Um, and um, it might be worth asking yourself, is it, ref is it um, worth referring that person on to um, a genetic service? Um, but as I said, the anxiety levels in such people can be, um, um, from the outsider's point of view, um, not, you know, incomprehensible, um, but that's because their lived life experience with a family member, a family member with breast cancer might be quite traumatic. Um, and so that um, heightened anxiety, um, you know, there's could be good reasons behind it. And that's when a, a very talented and skilled clinic, a genetic counselor um, is invaluable. Some of those tools um, would uh, mention the FAQ uh, website. Um, I'll mention FRABOC. Um, so that's available at the Cancer Australia um, website. And it's an online calculator. You just ask the patient questions. You can do it in your surgery. Uh, type in the, what the patient answers and that gives you um, a, a risk calculator for that person developing um, mutation. Um, so these are things that can be easily done in a, in a GP uh, surgery. Um, Breast in Queensland have their own screening tool. Um, Bodicea is, um, uh, I guess, a, bit of a specialist screening tool. Um, I won't talk any more about it. That's what they can be used in the genetic counselling, in the clinical genetics uh, service. Um, when looking at a family history of breast cancer, it, it, um, it can be difficult in your surgery because as I um, sort of went through before, um, verifying a, a alleged family history um, is, is difficult. It's, it's time consuming. Um, and, um, you know, without consent from other family members, it's, it can be impossible. Um, so, you know, examples of, you know, why you might um, be getting incorrect information or you might be making incorrect conclusions is that um, a family member had a double mastectomy, for, for instance, um, and you think, well, they had a double mastectomy because they had bilateral breast cancer. Why else would you have two breasts removed? Well, sometimes because they, um, 
whatever prophylactic mastectomy on one side. And if you're taking one breast off, we might as well take both off. Um, so um, a double mastectomy doesn't necessarily mean um, bilateral breast disease. Um, a family history of ovarian cancer is often inaccurate. We find that that might be um, a, um, some other sort of pelvic malignancy. Um, cervical cancer is often reported as ovarian cancer for reasons I'm not sure of, but that's, that's a very common um, misreport that we, that we get. Um, I won't go through that again. We've talked about surveillance options available um, and risk reducing surgery that's, that's possible. Um, there are high risk management clinics um, around the country in Queensland, or uh, well, in Brisbane, I should say, um, the big breast cancer clinics at, in Chermside, um, PA, um, well, it's been, this is recently opened, it's been going for a couple of years now. Um, the RBWH has a clinic now. Um, there's a clinic on the Gold Coast and private specialists um, often have a, um, a network which um, is not, is, isn't a single clinic, um, but they um, offer a similarly high quality, quality service. Um, it's, just, it's just not a one-stop shop. The nice things about um, high-risk clinics is it's one-stop shop for your patient. So they get to know the people and don't have to um, make multiple appointments. They can have all their surveillance on the, on the one day in the one place. Um, as I said, um, Genetic testing is not undertaken for women um, who don't have a, a personal history of um, cancer, unless it's a, a predictive test. Um, and so they themselves haven't had tests, um, haven't had cancer, but a family, other family member has had cancer, a pathogenic mutation has been found in that um, family member. They can then have a predictive testing to see if they carry that pathogenic mutation. Um, Self-funded testing can be facilitated, as I've said before. Um, but if we're doing that, it, we're going to be counselling the, the patient. Look, you know, you're going to get your bang from your buck if you're testing a family member. Um, so, just a couple of um, family histories, because I know that um, this is a clinical talk. So here's a um, a good family history. We've got a young aunt, uh, young onset. Um, breast cancer at 39 years. Um, her mother, um, you know, wasn't all that old. I think, you know, 59 years isn't young onset, um, young onset by definition, but it's youngish. Um, but the sister there with pancreatic cancer who died, um, that's really ringing alarm bells. So the two women with breast cancer, you know, young, two youngish onset, I'm, you know, worried one might be dealing with a BRCA1 mutation, throwing the pancreatic cancer. Um, I'd be surprised if I didn't find that in this mutation. However, the person who's come to see us is the younger woman's daughter. So um, if we test her and find out that she's negative, we're left in that position of not knowing if there isn't a BRCA mutation in the family to be found or there is one and um, she just doesn't carry it. In this particular family, um, other family members... Um, um, were tested and no surprise um, that the uh, two women with breast cancer have the mutation. Um, the woman who died from pancreatic cancer was found to have the mutation. We've Now that negative test result actually means so much more. We can actually be quite confident in saying to her, um, she's not at increased risk. Whereas before, I couldn't say that. Um, in this family, two unaffected people have been found to carry the mutation. Um, and whilst that you know, it could be perceived as bad news. Um, finding it's good news because now we know that the previously they didn't know if they were at increased risk. Well, I suppose by virtue of the family history they are, but they didn't know for sure. Now we know they are for sure and surveillance uh, measures can be put in place. The alternate um, for her not having a mutation is that there wasn't one to be found. So you see, we like to test an individual who um, has had um, the, the cancer. So, you know, if you, if you are concerned about a family history of breast cancer, then the genetic service is always going to be wanting to see an affected family member. Um, now, even if they're not your patient, you could talk to your patient, you know, if it's a first degree relative, would your mum or your sister be interested in seeing a genetic service? 
and try to get them in um, to be seen um, because that will cut down a lot of faffing around trying to work out whether or not um, genetic testing is going to be um, done in the family. Um, but don't let that put you off um, referring a patient, although wait lists are long and I appreciate um, you know, some of you may have had patients on wait lists who haven't had cancer themselves. Um, um, and you think, well, you know, I get these referrals back to me saying, you know, they haven't had cancer, they haven't had cancer themselves, we're not testing. And, you know, you've waited 12 to 18 months to, to hear that advice. Um, if there are people in the family who um, would be good to test and they've got a malignancy that limits their lifespan, then they'll get triaged. So in your referral, do say, you know, her, um, you know, Auntie Joan currently has breast cancer and has not got long to live. They'll be getting, you know, got into the um, clinic quick smart. Um, so people, um, you know, with individuals, affected individuals in the family who potentially could have testing um, uh, will be triaged higher. And that's um, sort of a, a category one um, there aren't many emergencies in genetics, but that's, I guess, one of them. Um, if you high risk, if you've got a patient with high risk fe features, and you know you're not comfortable organising testing, or the patient hasn't organised testing themselves, then by all means refer that to a genetic service. So there are those high risk features: triple negative breast cancer, young age of onset, um, 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 or any cancer really in less than 30 years of age. Um, but if you're referring a patient to a genetic service, it's helpful if um, um, you let the patient know that that doesn't mean they're going to be having testing. Um, that Yeah, it doesn't mean they're, go they're going to be ha having testing. Um, there was another thought there I was, had, but it's lost. Uh, it's eight o'clock now, so I'll just whip through colorectal cancer. So just like breast cancer, most cases of colorectal cancer are sporadic. Um, when we're dealing with, there, there are actually quite a large number of um, inherited colorectal cancer syndromes, uh, but the two big ones, um, uh, Lynch syndrome and then a number of polyposis syndrome. Lynch syndrome, um, you might have heard uh, called hereditary uh, uh, HNPCC, hereditary non-polyposis um, um, colorectal cancer syndrome. Um, but it's, it's the original name was Lynch syndrome. It's gone back to Lynch syndrome now just to, Confuse you all. Um, this is a similar graphic to the one I showed for, for breast cancer. You see that the lion's share of um, individuals with um, bowel cancer do not have a heritable uh, predisposition. Of the five to ten percent of cases that do have a heritable uh, predisposition, um, only a small subset of those are actually in genes that we can uh, test and identify. Just like with breast cancer, there can be polygenic. Uh, risk factors. So these are genes that come together in a family. Um, um, and so we see that clustering of um, uh, in a family of, of diagnoses of colorectal cancer syndrome. Now Lynch syndrome um, is actually underdiagnosed. Um, it's becoming less so um, um, because of um, our testing. It's caused by mutations in one of those uh, caretaker genes or uh, the mismatch repair genes. And um, as I mentioned before, it's associated with not just colorectal and gastric cancer, but also endometrial cancer to a lesser extent, um, ovarian cancer, um, and sebaceous adenoma is a particular skin lesion. What's happened, um, I guess I'm getting old now, it's, it's become more, it's definitely common now, but it's become increasingly common in the last 20 years. Uh, certainly when I started genetics, it wasn't uh, at all common but immunohistochemistry is undertaken for the mismatch repair proteins. And so this should be a routine test done on tumors looked under the microscope. Um, so, you know, these tumors are examined, not just for the diagnosis, but if it looks like a, a you know, a bowel cancer, then they should have immunohistochemistry for the mismatch repair proteins. And the mismatch repair uh, genes and therefore the proteins are MLH1, MSH2, um, MSH6 and PMS2. I um, uh, don't particularly want you to remember those, um, but if um, um, patients have loss of 
uh, PMS2 um, or MSH6 or MSH2 um, alone, then um, they should be referred to clinical genetics. That's a high chance that the patient's actually got a mutation in the underlying gene. Um, and so they need to be assessed for a heritable predisposition. Now, if there's a mutation, if there's a um, loss of MLH1, and so if you're going to remember um, any of these uh, genes, remember MLH1. Um, MLH1 is, loss of MLH1 is actually quite common in sporadic cancers. And so that um, will, should undergo further testing, um, depending on whether test is done. It might not necessarily be done in the private sector, it's certainly done in the public sector. Um, and it's a sort of cascade testing, which is, is undertaken. Um, and so um, the cascade testing, I'll, and I'll just mention this, not for you to necessarily remember it, but just to let you know that there's a specific mutation, a gene called BRAF, called um, V600E. If it's present, um, then that actually indicates that we're dealing with a, a a sporadic tumour, um, and so um, the histopathologist should report that that's, you know, no further testing is required. So if you get that recommendation, that's probably why. The other reason why you might not see MLH1 come up in your immunohistochemistry is that the gene's been turned off, and that's this process of methylation. Um, abnormal methylation is, I guess, one of those acquired uh, mutations that occur in cancers. And so um, in endometrial cancer, which can be a feature of, of Lynch syndrome, um, if there's um, methylation of um, the MLH1 gene, um, then that's sort of pointing more towards a, um, a somatic mutation or a somatically acquired event rather than something that's, that's heritable. But if a, a germline mutation is found in any of those genes, then there are um, you know, very uh, well uh, described surveillance me measures, including an annual um, uh, colonoscopy. It says here gastroscopy for additional risk factors for gastric cancer. Most gastroenterologists will probably add in the gastroscopy every second colonoscopy um, because of the risk of ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer, then um, both ovaries and uh, uterus are removed again, usually after the age of childbearing um, and you know, 40 is kind of that um, sort of early age of menopause. Um, there's been many trials done with low dose aspirin, 100 milligrams a day um, in Lynch syndrome, and that decreases the chance of uh, developing colorectal cancer. Um, and so um, these individuals are actually put on long-term term aspirin. And uh, we do recommend, um, certainly if they come through Genetic Health Queensland, um, that they're enrolled on the fa Queensland Family Cancer Registry. Um, and that registry helps individuals remember to undergo their um, surveillance. Just like with breast cancer, there are tools available to the GP to try and work out if you're dealing with a high or low risk. So again, the Cancer Council of Australia, um, which is a... Um, a Get this money from the NHMRC. So if you but you just Google Cancer Council of Australia, um, that you'll get their bowel cancer guidelines. And then again, EVQ. Um, it's a that EVQ is a really good site. If, if you look at genetics, um, the, the first tab there, the pull in the pull down menu, um, pull down menu of the EVQ um, in their resources. Um, there's some good resources to um, to help you work out if you're dealing with something you need to be concerned about with a personal family with bowel cancer. A number of the bowel cancer syndromes um, um, have cutaneous clues. Um, now, some of these, you know, you've probably never heard of before, um, and they're certainly difficult to say. Um, but if you've got, I guess, the main take home message with, in this slide, is if you've got a, a patient with a pet family or um, personal history of bowel cancer, and they've got these cutaneous stigmata, um, it might be worth um, just doing a punch biopsy of one of them and just uh, looking under the microscope and say so something like a fibro folliculoma or, or a BAPOMA, which is a myelocytic nevus, a, a good histopathologist will know that that is highly, highly correlates with a, a, a cancer syndrome and will let you know. 
Um, and certainly if you put on the request form, um, um, has, has personal history of bowel cancer, then they will, they will take that into uh, consideration. So just to let you know that there are mucocutaneous uh, stigmata um, for the heritable bowel cancer syndromes. Um, so that's something else just to, to add to your toolkit of things that you need to be looking out for. Okay, so bear with me while I just get my other computer here up and running. It's just sort of timed out. And so far, Sandra, you're, I think, the only person who um, has submitted questions. Sorry, I've got, uh, I might need your help, Sabrina, but um, just to answer your two questions here, so, so, um, well, it's kind of the same question, Sandra. Uh, when will genetic testing for breast cancer be affordable? Um, again, <laughs> I guess that word affordable is a bit relative, isn't it? Um, depends um, on how much money you've got in the bank account. Um, so online tests, so direct-to-consumer testing um, is arguably affordable, affordable, not to everyone, but... Um, you can get a reasonably good um, direct-to-consumer test for between $500 and $1,000, which isn't small change for everyone, I, I appreciate. Um, but I think it's probably not going to get much cheaper than that, at least in the short term. But that test will um, um, test multiple genes. It does have some clinical support around it. So I, I would argue that it is relatively affordable now. Um, but for um, but for individuals who can't afford that, um, then um, if they qualify for testing in the public sector, then their um, uh, genetic service will cover the cost. And going on from your next question here, I assume you're in New South Wales or Sydney. Um, there are a number of cancer services in Sydney, uh, genetic cancer services in Sydney. Um, but you know they are public and uh, won't test everyone that walks through the door. Um, the um, when will genetic testing of the actual breast cancer tumor be made available? And uh, will it be affordable? Hospital in Sydney has been testing DNA um, for a year or more. When will it be available here in the public? So that's is your answer here. Cost estimation. So that kind of, I, I saw your question, you put it in this afternoon, ladies, and I saw it there. So I've kind of incorporated my talk here. I hope you don't mind, Sandra. Um, um, because this is the last point I wanted to talk about tonight. And this is somatic tumor testing. So this is different from germline testing. And you recall at the start of this evening, I went to great lengths to point out that all cancer is genetic, but not necessarily heritable. Testing of a tumor, um, the primary reason for doing that is not to find heritable predispositions. Now, of course, the DNA in your tumor um, um, will have that same heritable disposition if one is there, but that's not why people do testing. Because um, if you're looking for a heritable um, predisposition, then you're going to test any um, uh, tissue, really. It's usually a blood test or a saliva sample. Reasons to test tumors. The reasons we do that is for diagnosis or prognosis. So just as um, you know, an oncologist wants a tissue diagnosis to know what they're dealing with, um, and that's generally doing um, uh, histology and looking down the microscope, the genetic signature of, a, of the tumor is um, becoming an increasing part, increasingly important part of the subclassification of tumors. Um, and you want to classify tumours um, for diagnosis and also prognosis um, because certain, um, certain molecular signatures um, are associated with you know, better prognosis and some are associated with the poor prognosis. So molecular testing of tumours um, is actually done the same reason why we do histopathology on a tumour for that diagnosis slash prognostic reason. The next reason why tumours are sampled um, is for management. And so this comes part of this whole um, personalised medicine era that we're um, entering. And for um, breast cancer, then um, there are, uh, well, I suppose there's at least one um, 
drugs. So there's a gene, I can't think of the name of it, but it's one of the kinases. So the kinases are a part of the, the growth promoting pathway um, of, um, um, of, of cells. And so um, one of the um, uh, kinases um, can be um, activated. Um, so just thinking, I think it's a, a PIC gene, P-I-C-K gene, um, and there's a drug, um, um, a pelicid, um, which is a kinase inhibitor. So it actually, um, with this a somatically acquired mutation, basically the accelerator is working too well. Um, and what um, um, a pelicid does is come in and inhibits that kinase pathway um, and, and you know, basically cuts off that accelerator. And so, testing of um, tumors is um, becoming important for management um, and diagnosis. I mentioned BRAF before. BRAF can be mutation, mutated in a number of cancers. And in the example I gave before, was that was for diagnosis prognosis. If that's if a BRAF V600E mutation is present in the setting of a, um, having absence of the mismatch repair po protein MLH1, um, that um, tells us that we're not dealing with a heritable um, predisposition. So that's dealing with, I guess, family management. We're not going to start looking for heritable um, uh, mutations in MLH1. Um, um, the, um, but increasingly, especially with these kinases, uh, there is a, a BRAF um, um, is, a, is another kinase, uh, um, and there are kinase inhibitors. Um, um, BRAF can be um, mutated in melanoma, and so the kinase inhibitors are common now in, in melanoma. And so if they've got a mutation BRAF in melanoma, then um, the kinase inhibitor has been one of those game changers in melanoma, which really has improved the prognosis for those, uh, I'll say, use the term loosely, likely enough to have um, a mutation in BRAF because of uh, causing their uh, melanoma. Um, but the other reason why um, we test tumors is for disease monitoring, especially in leukemias. So you can imagine with the leukemia, um, you can, you know, the blood cells are in the blood, so blood tests, you can see if there's residual disease. Um, but if you remember back, for those of you who joined us for our first lecture, when we looked at non-invasive prenatal testing, we talked about cell-free DNA, looking at fetal DNA, the same thing um, or principles can apply um, with tumours. So tumours are um, rapidly turning over um, entities. Um, as cells die in a tumour, they release um, DNA into the circulation and that stays there. Um, for a period of time, and that can be picked up through um, a blood test. And so tumour testing um, is, is um, undertaken for disease monitoring. That's not direct tumour testing in that instance. It's looking at it's direct DNA testing, but through blood tests. Okay, so I hope that answers your question, Sandra. So um, DNA testing for breast cancer tumours, um, and I, I guess I'll it's a little bit out of my field. I'm not sure what the um, practice is, but I think you'll find most of your tertiary institutions, if there's a, a management or prognosis reason to do it, they'd, they'd already be doing it. Um, but the reason they're doing it is not to find out for heritable predispositions, um, but it's for those um, prognosis management reasons. Of course, you know, you might find a BRCA1 or BRCA mutation if you're doing a next generation sequencing approach of breast cancer testing tumor, in which case, um, that patient should be referred to a clinical genetic service to work out the pathogenicity or otherwise of that tumour, whether it's in their germline. So just because it's in the tumour doesn't mean it's in their germline. So that would require testing another tumour, another tissue to see if it's in the germline. And if present, then counselling the patient and then organising cascade testing. Um, in Queensland, um, uh, we have a, a single service, um, Genetic Health Queensland. It's physically based at the Royal Brisbane Hospital, um, but it does uh, clinics up and down the coast. Um, it doesn't really go much inland except to Toowoomba. Um, um, otherwise, all the um, centres are, are coastal um, and they're all sort of assigned a, a clinical genetic, uh, uh, sorry, a genetic counsellor who helps um, organise and triage the referrals. So if you're not based in Brisbane, um, it'd be worth um, trying to work out who your local genetic counsellor is because I could offer just some friendly advice on the phone if you, if you needed it. Um, our um, clinics used to be all be done face to face, but um, we just like COVID's forced uh, the world to enter um, the 21st century. 
um, Waitley Civil um, Force Genetic Health Queensland to enter the health 21st century and telehealth now used um, throughout the state. So we don't um, rely on face-to-face -face, um, testing. Um, so I keep saying we, I, I used to work for Genetic Health Queensland, but I actually no longer do. So, um, um, but it is, it is the statewide service. So if you're after a public service, that's the one you want to be referring to. Um, and if you go to their website, they have referral films there and instructions on how to submit those. Um, if you're interested in referring to a private clinical genetic service, unfortunately, private clinical geneticists are few and far between. Um, and I'm trying, to, there used to be four, now there's only three in Queensland. They're all based in Brisbane. Um, and uh, feel free to flick me an email if you want some suggestions. Um, uh, but probably of those three, one, one of those individuals is actually more experienced with cancer testing than the other two. Um, but that's not to say the other two um, aren't qualified for cancer testing. Um, when referring to a clinical geneticist, if you know the family's already been to genetics and you've got their um, um, genetic number, that's, a, that's quite useful. So they can match up uh, the family members and work out what they're dealing with. Um, it might be you're referring a, a patient because they've walked through your door. So you've got a long-standing patient. They've out of the blue received a, a letter um, from a relative saying, um, you know, a mutation has been found in your family. We, we recommend um, you be referred to your family, to your, to your service. Um, um, please include a copy of that letter because uh, there'll be information on that letter which will help the clinical genetic service work out, you know, what the fam familial mutation is. Um, and even if it's a letter from um, someone not in the jurisdiction. So, you know, these letters get sent around the countryside. So if a patient was, a mutation was found in New South Wales and a New South Wales um, service wrote um, on behalf of the patient, please see a genetic service, um, a mutation's been found in your family. Our reference number is this. Um, that letter gets now sent to the family member in Queensland. The service in Queensland can then actually contact the original service. This is your um, reference number. This is what this is the information we need. So those um, um, inf that information um, can streamline the process. If you're worried about someone um, dying in the family before being seen, then obviously let us know that uh, because um, they um, could potentially get seen sooner. And if you're unsure, then there's always a genetic counselor on call to give friendly advice. As I said before, there are triaging systems and so um, urgent things will get seen urgently. So if we're worried about someone dying, they'll get seen urgently. Um, some of these um, um, patients are you know, emergency management decisions that need to be made, they'll get seen urgently. Um, we uh, see predictive testing um, more urgently than family history of, of cancer, simply because those family history of cancers are often, you know, there's not much that, that we can offer, whereas predictive testing, it's important to diagnose that sooner um, because interventions, potentially life-saving interventions are available. Okay, so that's all I have to talk about tonight. Just going back to Slido. Um, the looking so we did have some questions there um interestingly the majority of my audience tonight are not gps so um welcome all you non-gps to genomics for gps that's an uh, interesting statistic that uh, over two-thirds of people here are not general practitioners um which kind of makes the next question i asked have you ever used the EVIQ website a bit redundant because if you're not a gp then you're not really going to have used it, but even assuming that all the people that answered question one have answered question two, the vast majority have not used EVIQ. Um, if, it, if you know you do have patients um, with um, a personal family history of cancer, it's something that interests you. I'd highly recommend getting onto that EVIQ website and just having a look under that first tab um, and look at the resources available. As I said, it's, it's all been um, um, curated by um, well, they're international experts, really, but it's the Australian um, um, cancer community and it's oncologists, it's surgeons, it's uh, clinical geneticists. It's a very high quality res um, uh, resource um, 
and it's 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 quite usable, user friendly. Um, and so they're really the only questions there um, that's worth answering. I'll just give uh, this Sandra. You've asked a couple more questions here. Um, can you give us more information on the breast cancer clinic at Marta at Rabina? Uh, I'm we can't really because I don't really I've never referred there. Um, is in our private hospital at Rabina. I don't know. That's sorry. That was one of Helen who I acknowledged at the start of tonight. One of her slides. Um, not that I know of, Sandra. Actually, now that you say that, the only martyrs I'm familiar with in Queensland are um, uh, obviously the martyr private in, in uh, Brisbane, and there's one in Townsville. I don't know one in. Um, I'd have to look that up, but I can do that for you if you like. Uh, the tumor DNA testing is being used for testing treatments against the uh, tumor chemotherapy that might not work. Yeah, so um, the that's that's kind of what I was um, getting at with the kinase inhibitors, um, and there are molecular signatures um, um, in a number of tumors which um, confer a good or bad prognosis, and so especially with your traditional. Um, uh, chemotherapeutic agents, which are you know highly poisonous, and you don't want to be giving um, these highly poisonous chemicals to individuals who um, you know there's evidence that they're not going to work. And so it does it helps with that uh, that personalised uh, medicine. Um, and so Sandra's qualified now so that uh, you understand somatic testing as opposed to. Um, uh, germline testing. So that's great. Um, that's uh, uh, one of the, the, the take home messages for tonight because it, um, doctors and patients alike do get um, the two confused. Um, but because cancer is a genetic disease, all cancer is genetic. Um, and with this personalized medicine, we will increasingly see uh, cancers being having genetic testing, but that's not looking for germline mutations. That's not looking to see if there's a heritable predisposition. Um, and that's a, an important uh, lesson um, to, to be had. So if there are no other questions, um, and I'm just hesitating, giving people the chance to answer, but nothing's coming through, um, then I'll say good night. So thanks for your attendance tonight. Um, thanks for Queensland Genomics for sponsoring and uh, thanks uh, to CheckUp, in particular David and Sabrina, who's um, attended now for three months in a row after hours uh, to make sure everything runs smoothly in the background there um, and introduce me. So um, good night, everyone. <laughs>